Hi, I'm Dave Lenander, and this is TV Bookshelf. I'm with a monthly discussion group called the Rivendell Group in the Twin Cities, where we talk about fantasy, myth, and science fiction. And one of our almost founder members was P.C. Hodgel when she was a lowly grad student at the <laughs> University of Minnesota. <laughs> and today she's here with us visiting from her home in Wisconsin. Uh, when we started the, dis the Rivendell discussion group, we talked about Tolkien, Lewis, Charles Williams, and then branched out to other writers, including some of the great 19th century fantasists. Um, you were studying particularly 19th century fantasy, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering how that informed your approach to writing, or were you already writing about Jane then? Uh, I believe I had started, but just barely. Um, I was really a very late starter in terms of being a writer. I didn't do very much until between college and graduate school. So you would have caught me at the very beginning of my efforts. Uh, and I was definitely studying Victorian literature. I was learning and learning to appreciate the, the plot intensities uh, of something like Dickens. And uh, uh, I think I got my taste for the convoluted plot that way. <laughs> Well, I remember that out of Rivendell, or partly out of Rivendell, Ruth Berman and Eleanor Arneson, mm -hmm. two writers who'd already been published some, started a discussion group, or a, a writer's group that kind of ran separately. And you were part of that, I think, almost from the beginning, and along with Mike Levy, and I can't even remember exactly who else was in it at the beginning. Was Al Kufeld there yet? Yes. And so that must certainly have had some impact as you wrote uh, on the fiction that eventually became Godstock. Mm -hmm. And I can also remember how excited we were. I think it was probably after, actually after you left the Twin Cities when A Matter of Honor appeared finally. And that came partly out of um, the, I, I remember hearing some of the chapters read earlier mm -hmm. of Godstock. We had to wait a long time for that book. Ah, yes. Can you Sorry talk about a little that. bit about, <laughs> about writing that? And I think you also went to Clarion. Uh, yes. Um, well, I wrote a couple of short stories during the year between college and graduate school just to see if I actually could. Then I started graduate school, which is where I met Rivendell and, and Eleanor and you and uh, the whole Minneapolis crew. Um, and I'd just come back from uh, the Clarion Writers Workshop, too, which I had never heard of before, uh, but um, Kate Wilhelm had mentioned that it was a good thing to go to, so I had applied. and. Basically, it brought me out of the closet. Uh, I had been really frightened to admit that I wanted to write stories, mm -hmm. uh, just in case it turned out I couldn't. Um, no one wants to be the, well, I've got this great book in me if I only had the time sort of person. Mm -hmm. um, and I took off a year between the master's and the PhD program to write Godstock. I could not do the classwork and the book at the same time. I just couldn't. So I suspect what you were hearing was probably parts of it when I got back. Uh, that could be. It could be. I, I remember reading sections of it. I remember specific reactions of people at various times. And it was very encouraging to have some feedback. I was getting a lot of it from Mike Levy, which was tremendously helpful. Um, but it also helped us to hear it read out loud, for me to read it out loud to other mm -hmm. people and to hear not only what it sounded, but also to know how other people were reacting to it. That's one thing you can really tell. If, you, if a story catches your audience, you've got them. Um, now when I give public readings, uh, I ca I'm not very good at looking up and catching the camera's eye or other people's eyes, but under, under the book, I'm watching the, pe the feet of the people in the front row. <laughs> and if they stop jiggling, I know I've got them. <laughs> and if they laugh, I really know I've got them. <laughs> well, that is something that your, your fiction is so dark that sometimes maybe people almost fail to notice that also it's often very humorous. It's really discouraging to give a reading when I know it's going to be very dark, and I know I can't expect laughter, but I still miss it. <laughs> um, but of course, with anything that's that dark, you need the moments of laughter. You need the relief. I need the relief as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I've got a character who basically will go through just so much before she stops and says, this is ridiculous. <laughs> How much more can go on here? 
And then, of course, I threw something more at her. <laughs> Why don't you talk a moment about the, the backstory and the setup for the novels, and then explain a little bit about, so far there's four novels and another one in, in progress? Uh, backstory as in, okay, where, where is all this? All right, the, the basic premise um, is that you've got, uh, it, it's going to sound very stereotyped, a lot of fantasies do if you, if you really pare them down. Uh, you've got people, three races, that have been chosen to fight a great battle. Um, they've been consistently losing this battle for something like 30 millennia. They are very annoyed at their god at this point. <laughs> because he, seem, he, she, it seems to have packed up and gone on someplace else. It's not helping them, and they've still got this enemy, Paramal Darkling, on their hands. It's slowly working its way down the chain of creation, the interlocked worlds towards them, and they are at the, basically the last world that they can stand on. Um, so this, this is it. At some point at this, in this story chain, uh, they have got to meet and beat or be beaten by this thing which is coming. Um, it's not actually evil in itself, it's just incredibly alien. But the effect that he has on people tends to, be, tends to turn them towards evil, it tends to turn them I don't know, mad with power, mad with ambition, mad with mm -hmm. something. So uh, I, I tend to try to veer away from simply black and white. Anyway, um, what's happening is that um, these people have been sitting around waiting all this time for the god to actually manifest itself in three of individuals, uh, that which creates, that which destroys, that which preserves. And um, it doesn't help that these people keep getting born and then keep getting killed by their own people because they're dangerous. You have to have all three of them, otherwise imbalance. Mm -hmm. At the moment, my heroine um, has beginning to realize that she is that which destroys. Um, and she's not being very well balanced, <laughs> except by herself, except by the sense of honor which she learned, mm -hmm. uh, paradoxically, in Paramal Darkling itself. Um, and so she has to um, survive and find a place among her people in a society that does not really give women of her caste much option, their breeding stock. Um, she's not. <laughs> she likes to get out, she likes to explore, um, invariably she starts trouble, invariably cities burn up or houses fall down <laughs> when she's around. And against that background, the first book, Godstock, is about Jane sort of awakening and finding herself in flight from Paramil Darkling, or from the, in any case, evil ghosts and haunts chasing her. And she comes to the city of Titastagon, mm -hmm. uh, which owes something to Fritz Leiber. Oh, a lot, a lot. <laughs> and um, what was running through this city, which is haunted by all kinds of gods, um, and demons and mm -hmm. strange things, and she has a whole series of adventures, mm -hmm. becoming a, a thief along the way, uh, part of the Thieves' Guild. It's, I guess, not exactly a respected, I guess it's a respected, but Well, it is within that city, <laughs> but on the other hand, she has a code of honor that doesn't allow her to steal anything valuable. <laughs> yes, a problem for a thief. Uh, so she's purely um, the, the art thief, I mean, in, in terms of she's in it for the technique. She's in it basically because it's one way to get inside the society, inside the city, because she wants to know what on earth is going on. She's a monotheist who's been dumped into a city which is lousy with gods. So either everything she's been taught is completely wrong, um, or what, or what's going on there. And um, I'm not sure I really was thinking of that when I started it. As you say, it has a lot, it owes a great deal to Fritz Leiber. I wanted to write something that was along his lines, just to see if I could write a book, mm -hmm. to see if I could plot a novel. And so I dropped her into this marvelous um, play playground, which is rampant with just about everything. And then she has to work her way through to figure out what actually is going on here. What is the source of power before it destroys her, before it destroys the city? seems to be a continuing motif. Um, there's always something after her that she has to understand before it gets to her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you 
Uh, had your manuscript accepted by Athenaeum, a children's house, which must have surprised you a little. Great deal. Um, they wanted you to trim a lot of the book. And you said once uh, to me or someone in my hearing that they didn't appreciate that this was a Dickensian novel with a lot of multiple plot lines and many, many characters. Can you talk a little bit about the, the discussion that you had to have with your editor and hmm. how that changed your book or shaped your book? Well, um, as you say, I didn't write it as a young adult book. Um, I didn't submit it originally to young adult publishers. It never occurred to me. Uh, it only ended up at Athenaeum because somebody at another publisher ended up leaving them and walking across the street with it. So suddenly I'm getting letters from Athenaeum. And one of them um, said, in, in effect, well, we really had a doubts about this at first. The first person who read it really bounced off of it because it was so complicated. Fantasy should only have one plot line. And I'm thinking, A? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, I'm reading Dickens. I'm reading, uh, even Marvel Comics had many mm -hmm. multiple com yes. plot lines at that point, And that was another major influence on me. <laughs> um, and so we talked back and forth. Um, Luckily, it turned out that the publisher was not determined for me to trim everything out. I couldn't have. The thing had something like five plot lines. They mm -hmm. were the plot. I had a, a wall-sized chart. I was keeping track of this whole thing. It was all, how does this thread interact with that thread? If you knock a brick over here, what building falls over down the line? Um, there was no way I could turn it into a single plot book. and. Um, Know, blessed be to the publisher, uh, she eventually was willing to, with some trimming, allow me mm -hmm. to, to go on my, my multi-stranded multi way. Uh, but I was very grateful t to her for her criticism at the same time because there was a lot of extraneous material in there that, that shouldn't have been. I was just playing around. I didn't mm -hmm. know what was going to ultimately fit and what wasn't. Um, so, yeah, having a good publisher, a good editor, as, especially as a beginning writer, is a tremendous boon. And uh, I really wonder today if, if the new writers are getting that sort of benefit. I think that probably varies, but <sighs> one thing is, is you may have been fortunate to be published by Children's House because Jane Yolen commented once that her experience as a children's writer was that the children's editors were a lot a lot more helpful to her mm. in challenging what she'd done, in questioning what she'd done, in making suggestions. When she started publishing on the adult side, she found that they just accepted what she'd done, and there wasn't much uh, mm. request that she, which she found actually difficult. She had to ask her husband to step in and be the, the critical reader who would mm -hmm. challenge what she'd done. She said that was a lot harder than working with the editors in the children's houses. Uh, yes. Um, I certainly had a lot less editing once I got into the adult line, and I missed it. Uh, because, well, as you know, you get too close to something. It's really hard to tell what's working, what's not working, um, which is why I still give it to friends to read. And even if they can't do what Jean Carl at Athenaeum did for me and say exactly, well, this has to go, this and that and the other mm -hmm. thing, they can tell me, this is too slow, this is too fast, this is too complicated, this is not making sense. And then, since now I've had enough experience, I can go back and, and do the editing myself. Mm -hmm. But it's tremendously helpful to me, to any writer, to have an intelligent uh, feedback system. Mm -hmm. And if you're not getting it from your publisher, you need it from somebody. Now, Godstock had quite a reaction from a lot of readers. There were a lot of people who liked it a whole lot. Um, it took you a while to produce the sequel. Uh, Dark of the Moon, though, mm. was was that because of the dissertation, or did the dissertation come after that? Dissertation came after that. Um, well, what happened was, Godstock came out. A, I was all set to try to start my doctoral dissertation, but I wanted to be sure that I was on the right track as far as Athenaeum was concerned for the sequel. It turned out to be Dark of the Moon, so I sent them a plot summary and basically got back a contract. So I put the dissertation on the shelf and I wrote um, Dark, of the, Dark of the Moon, which turned out to be a much longer and rather darker book. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been extremely 
um, lucky in that people have kept faith with me and have waited as we know I'm not, <coughs> I'm not a very fast writer and I've gotten slower, <laughs> which scares me. Um, but um, for some reason it uh, seems to have rung a bell for a lot of people. I think partly because it comes out of my own built growing up, my own childhood, my own doubts, my own mm -hmm. fears, which while they are of course unique to me, they are also uh, unique to every single person on earth probably. Um, you know, we're all trying to find ways to fit in. We all feel as if we're aliens at some point. And uh, a lot of people identified with that more than I was expecting. Uh, a lot of young men identified with it, which really surprised me because the, um, the rule of thumb is that uh, young men do not read female protagonists. Uh, you know, why not? You know, I, re I read male protagonists. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. It just sort of struck me as interesting. Well, it could be that James adventures as a thief and all the, the violence and blood and dark adventures maybe, maybe can cross a line where mm -hmm. maybe, maybe young men won't read stories about uh, Jane Austen heroines or something. Mm -hmm. Well, she is profoundly androgynous. Um, I'm going to have fun with that in the next one. Uh, <laughs> but yes, she certainly isn't limited to a romance role. She's certainly not limited to the stereotypes of uh, what women are supposed to be doing, either in our world or in her world, which is where a lot of the conflict comes in. At some of the neat things in the, uh, the books have to do with some of the magic and, and the strange creatures that you come up with. I, I know someone commented that uh, setting a snowstorm on fire has to have been a, a fantasy for someone who had lived in Minnesota, Wisconsin. <laughs> um, any other ideas you're particularly fond of? Uh, well, I'm working right now on a chapter where uh, we've got a rogue golden willow that's um, wandering around the, the landscape. It showed up in uh, Seeker's Mask. Um, I'm trying very hard not to be make it anything like an ant or anything like any of the other Old thing. Man Willow. Old Man Willow, right, yes. With, they're very hard precedents to uh, ignore. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a world that is incredibly animated. And um, uh, it, it's spring, the sap is running, and so is the tree. <laughs> you know, somebody's marked mm -hmm. it for harvesting, and it's taken off. In any case, after Dark of the Moon, you took time off to finish your dissertation, which mm -hmm. was on Ivanhoe? Ivanhoe, Sir Walter Scott, yes. And um, do you think that was a mistake, or are you glad you did that? Because it certainly put a halt in the James story. It brought my writing career to a screeching halt because, again, I cannot do criticism and creative work at the same time any more than I can teach and do creative work at the same time. So it's partly that I was just was slow, and it was partly that it took something like 10 years to find somebody willing to pick up a series in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, that was extraordinarily disheartening. Uh, I mean, three years of serious depression. Um, at the same time, academia is not, well, they're, they're better now than they used to be about accepting fantasy as a legitimate genre. Mm -hmm. When I was a graduate student, it definitely wasn't. Uh, I ran into a lot of um, prejudice of over that. On the other hand, if eventually I would like to take the material that I dis discovered as I was doing the Ivanhoe dissertation and it turned into a the fantasy fantasy sequel to Ivanhoe, which uh, I've already got something like a hundred thousand words of notes in my computer. Uh, the things I found are just incredible. It's like there's this whole secret history of England mm -hmm. that I didn't know anything about until I started putting all these things together. I mentioned a few of them to uh, Diane Wynne Jones, and she wrote back to say, you've discovered, I think she said, three major truths. Didn't tell me which ones they were. <laughs> and it's a good thing you're not writing this in England or the roof would blow off. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I have to write it someday. Well, that, that's Lionhearts, right? That's Lionhearts. Yeah, I heard a little bit from that at a con once, and, and I'm certainly looking forward to 
anytime you have time to finish that story. Right. It's sort of, do I do the series first? or do, do, ah. At least it taught me that mm -hmm. I could actually write something besides the series, and I did have serious doubts about that. You had written a couple short stories here and there along the way. But yes. Most of them were set in James World. I did do a Sherlock Holmes haunted house story. Mm -hmm. um, and that taught me a lot, too, that I, it didn't turn out to be co typical Conan Doyle by any means. I mean, a haunted house, mm -hmm. eh. <laughs> ghosts, eh. <laughs> And you have some of those short stories collected in Blood and Ivory, a tapestry. Yes, yes. That, those are the complete short stories, except for the one that Harlan Ellison has for Last Dangerous Visions. Is that a James story, too? No. Oh, okay. That's something yeah. I wrote for a challenge at Clarion. And I think I've got a copy of Around the House, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have always loved your artwork as well, influenced as it may be by some of the late uh, Victorian Edwardian. Mm, uh, Beardsley. Beardsley, in particular, uh, artists. Um, I wish that, um, I wish that uh, more of it was used uh, on your books, although I think uh, th this book actually has quite a bit. But uh, yeah, mostly now I'm doing fiber arts and stained glass oh. and uh, rearing a cold. <laughs> We didn't talk about the horse, who comes into the next book, but uh, let's mention the one we skipped so far. Um, I want to mention that the first two books are available now as Dark of the Gods in an omnibus volume, which is uh, uh, certainly uh, handy to have the first two oh, yes. there. I also think the cover is one of the <laughs> more illustrative of the actual scene. Uh -huh. I don't know how you feel about the art, but... I'm really pleased that they decided to put the covers of the books, uh, of everybody's books, in, of the University of Wisconsin on display in the administration building. So here are all these serious books about the economics and this and that. And then there's Gorgor the Lugubrious, <laughs> <laughs> the big green frog who's a salute to Kermit. I actually saw that when I was over there. Did you? <laughs> yes. And um, let's see, fourth book. Um, actually, the fourth book is the one I'm working on. Oh, that's on. the one you're working on, yes. Yes. <laughs> Which hopefully will be out in another couple of years? Or? Well, we're trying to bring it out for the um, LA Worldcon, which is not next September, but the one after that. Okay. Um, a little less than two years now. A little less than two years, but I need to get it in by about this time next year. And your working title again is? Uh, to Ride the Wrath Horn. Okay. Well, we'll have to be watching for that. And I'll just mention, too, that your art or your map drawing anyway, also appeared in Eleanor Hardison's book, uh, Daughter of the Bear Kings, set mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. So we have the fantasy cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, <laughs> along with the, the fantasy uh, map of uh, Anguilla. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have you done any other artwork that way? Um, some, not a lot. As I said, I'm sort of switching over to a different medium at this point, but the drawings are coming in very useful for designing stained glass and things like that. I've got a whole studio set up in the house now. Oh, great. I wish we had time to go into your horse stories. Uh, you were asking about uh, how the horses fit in. Um, in the fourth book, uh, there are quite a number of horses and horse-like creatures. There are the, the winnow here, which are immortal. Uh, uh, there's the Rathhorn colt that people have mentioned. Uh, who is after James Blood. Not a good idea, really, but um, uh, she did kill his mother. Um, and I knew that this was going to be a major part of the story, but I knew nothing hands-on about horses. So I went and first started taking riding lessons, and uh, two months later I, brought, I bought a Greenbroke horse, which is a horse who has never had much pack on it. In fact, she was a she's an Amer American saddlebred who had been in the field for six years, never touched, never handled. Um, she was wild. Um, she nearly killed me a good many times. <laughs> uh, I have fallen off her more times than I think anybody else in the stable combined. Have been very lucky to only collect bruises, but. And now we have bred her. I just came from a horse show where her, her, her colt, Peregrine Stargazer, <laughs> uh, Pip, mm -hmm. um, won third place, which was really nice. And the things that you, there's some research you can do with books, some research you really need to do 
hands-on. You really need to get a feeling for it. Uh, I was at a panel at Worldcon this last year in which the, the title was the, the, the Horse is Not a Motorcycle, in which three or four of us who had hands-on experience with horses were trying to tell would-be writers in the audience, you can't deal with a horse as if it was just something you stuck gas in and it went for X number of miles, um, and that was all there was to it. But that's all, those are, that was all the questions they asked. And here we are sitting there thinking, my goodness, there's so much more to this. There's the, what it feels like to be dealing with a horse, what, how a horse plays with you, how a horse can, can um, play rather roughly sometimes, what it feels like to be thrown, how you only have time for like two seconds of thought. One is, oh God, and the other one is, I don't want to land under his feet. <laughs> um, the feeling, the smell, all of the things that go into dealing with a living creature um, that I would have no idea of if I had not gone through this experience. And it healed me too because I was going through my mother's uh, decline in dement to dementia at that point and I needed to get away from the house. Mm -hmm. So being beaten up by a mare was preferable. Uh, I have written uh, one autobiographical essay for a book called Horse Dreams, uh, the, the Meaning of Horses in Women's Lives, which is being brought out by an Australian press. It will be available early in 2005. And uh, it's the only really autobiographical thing I've ever done. I couldn't stand to do it first person, so it's third person, but 99.9% .9 of it is true. I've been talking to PC Hodgell uh, about her books, Godstock, and the rest, the first two of which appear in Dark of the Gods, and uh, looking forward to her next book in a couple of years.